Welcome to our video training. Uh, this is Eric, conservation agronomist. Uh, this is through March 27th, 2019, and we're going to go through, Mark Washcheck and I are going to go through uh, some of the new changes or updates to the 590 standard. We're going to go over our 590 specification guide. We're going to go over a new spreadsheet to help document nutrient applications. Uh, we're going to show you where to find these documents and we'll do that first of all here. So Mark will open up. We need to find these um, on, you can just Google Field Office Tech Guide. That will take you to, maybe maybe Mark can just go along and, and show you how it goes. It's going to get you to our NRCS Field Office Tech Guide. There you go. Yep. Then we're going to choose our state. There's Field Office Tech Guide. Yep. Click that one. We're going to choose South Dakota. Submit, section four is where conservation practices are, and we're gonna, the third one down is conservation practices. This is all stored under the nutrient management. They're in alphabetical order. So oh, you just passed it, go back up to N, and then we have a few different things under nutrient management. We have the specification guide that we're gonna be going over. We've got the documentation requirements, We've got the job sheet, CPA 8, that's for manure management stuff. Then we have a statement of work. We have the nutrient management standard. And then we have the job sheet 590, which is what we're going to be demoing today for commercial fertilizer applications, variable rate or flat rate uh, commercial fertilizer. So with that, I will have Mark open the specification guide. Uh, we have it minimized at the bottom there. So here's a few of the updates from the 590 standard that was on eFotog there. That's about a 12-page document, uh, a lot of manure management stuff, a lot of commercial fertilizer stuff all um, mixed together. So a committee was put together and we kind of sorted out the, the commercial fertilizer stuff and that's the heading of this document here. So it's broke down into a few different categories. We have soil testing at first, yield goals later on, then we have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and how we're going to certify that this practice of 590 has been met. So we're going to go through this document and explain each one of these steps to you. So starting with soil testing, there's basically three ways agronomists or producers are soil testing for 590. They're either doing a flat rate application of nutrients and they're composite soil testing of the whole field, or they're setting up management zones and soil sampling by zone, or they're setting up grids and soil sampling by grid. So it's pretty common for composite and zone samples to do a zero to six and a six to 24 inch sample for N, P, and K. In the case of grid sampling, it's commonly done only on a zero to six basis, and that's okay for P and K and that initial year. Um, when we need to calculate the rate of nitrogen without having that six to 24 inch soil test, our specification guide says to use 40 pounds for in lieu of that 6 to 24 inch soil test. And when we get later on in our presentation today, we're going to show you a spreadsheet and how that 40 pounds is carried over into that spreadsheet. But for now, when it comes to soil testing, we're going to use 40 pounds on that initial year of grid sampling. Uh, when it comes back to your next nitrogen requiring crop, that's when we're going to ask that a 6 to 24 inch sample can be, will be taken. So that'll be be according to the EC750 from SDSU. And that, that 6 to 24 inch can be taken then either by management zones, field composite, yield maps, or other method recognized by SDSU. So that's a little bit about soil testing. Yield goals, uh, all our recommendations in South Dakota are still based on yield goals. So that's a huge uh, part of this whole recommendations process. So it's very important we get that part right. Uh, it's pretty easy when we got a field composite flat rate application. We can take our three consecutive years and average those. Uh, there's some maybe South Dakota egg st statistics yields we can use, but in the case of grids or zones, that becomes a little bit more challenging to get uh, yield by management zone. So we're going to rely on the producers to use their best judgment uh, and get realistic yield goals so that this whole process works correctly. So nitrogen management, we'd like you to use the SDSU EC750 formula, which 
For an example here, they have one of these for each nitrogen requiring crop. For corn, we have 1.2 times our yield goal and then subtract off our appropriate credits. That has not changed. That's still the same process we've always had. Um, they, they did add a little bit of a, a buffer or a tolerance level in there. If, if for some reason we deviate from that exact formula a little bit, there's a 30 pound tolerance level for nitrogen. Uh, maybe if you used an efficiency factor, maybe an organic matter credit, um, maybe you weren't able to variable rate starter. Some, for some reason that your, your formula changed a little bit, you have a 30 pound tolerance within that. Um, number eight on this guide, high leaching fields, that's the same as it's always been. Just no commercial fertilizer nitrogen, um, basically fall applied or no more than 45 days prior to planting. Uh, if there's incidental nitrogen, like in a DAP or a MAP, uh, phosphorus product, that's okay to be applied more outside that 45-day window. So that's nitrogen. Phosphorus, uh, similar to nitrogen, we have a formula that we use for every crop uh, to calculate the rate of phosphorus. Um, if for some reason we need to deviate from that exact formula for agronomic reasons, then there's a 30 pound buffer also or tolerance um, associated with phosphorus as well. Uh, one other slightly different tweak that's been done, if the exact formula for phosphorus calculates a zero rate, which a lot of times on the Olson scale, it's about 15 to 16 parts per million Olson for depending on the crop, that's gonna calculate a zero rate. But if we still want to apply a little bit of phosphorus, then we can use crop removal portion in the grain of the crop you're growing up to 25 parts per million, per million Olson or 35 parts per million, per million on the Bray 1 scale. So a little bit a leeway in there to, um, to build soil test phosphorus just a little bit. Uh, if you want to know what those crop removal rates are, they're in the SDSU publication EXEX8009. Um, it's okay to do a two-year spread. Uh, typically, I see this done for corn and beans. If you want to apply a little extra during the corn year for the following bean year, that is what I'm talking about is a two-year spread, and that's okay. Um, you know, just uh, as long as we're less than that 25 per part, parts per million Olson and 35 Bray again, then we'll add those two um, numbers together. Uh, that 30 pound tolerance or buffer that I mentioned, that does kind of have a cap on it. That's not allowed after we reach really high soil test phosphorus levels, uh, that being 76 Olson or 101 Bray on the Bray 1 scale. That's when no tolerance, no buffer is allowed anymore. Basically just a, a complete zero application for those high, high soil testing fields or zones. So I think that should cover phosphorus, potassium. Um, we're going to follow again those same lines. We're going to we're going to start with our exact formula for the crop we're growing. Um, if we do get a zero calculation, we can apply crop removal in the grain up to 200 parts per million on the soil test, uh, whichever is greater. And there is a, a buffer or tolerance for potassium as well, and that's in number 19, and that's 100 pounds. So that's a little bit higher than what nitrogen and phosphorus were. It's a 100 pound tolerance for potassium. Uh, again, we can do the two year spread for, for P and K. So same thing, we're just gonna add the two together. Um, same thing we did for phosphorus. Um, now when it comes to certifying this practice, that's really important. Uh, we just gotta make sure that we're covering the fields that are planned or scheduled to be uh, have nutrient management applied. So that's step number one, make sure we have the correct fields we're doing. And then depending on what part of the practice or enhancement we're doing, there we need to show that appropriately. So we need to email those documents. It's typically gonna be an application map of some kind, a soil test, or in the flat rate uh, fields, we can just apply uh, email a, an FSA map or a plan map would work. When it comes to these variable rate fields or the math uh, associated with calculating the rate, that's when this spreadsheet that we're going to demonstrate next needs to be completed. We need to complete this spreadsheet for two fields for each of the crops fertilized. So two corn fields that receive fertilizer, 
two bean fields, two wheat fields, for whatever crops you're growing that receive fertilizer, we need to fill this spreadsheet out for two of those fields. So not all the fields in the plan, but at least two per, per crop fertilized. So that's what we're, we're going to go over. Um, there's a few things about the spreadsheet that, that I'd like to show and, and talk to you about once we get to the spreadsheet. So um, with that, I guess there's a couple comments down here. If for any fields that receive manure application, we still want to use the CPA 8 or the CPA 63. The CPA 8 is pretty short, concise, and simple. I think you can you can uh, calculate rates for about five or six fields at, at once. If you need more fields than that, or if you want to do some zones or something with manure, then we, we definitely need the CPA 63. So that's the difference in those two forms. The same math will be calculated for both in both forms and then for fields that receive commercial fertilizer only then this this job sheet 590 that we're going to demo next is definitely the one that you'll want to use so all these forms and this whole process is all found through sdsu publications how you soil test 0 to 6 6 to 24 that can be clearly explained in this in the sdsu fs 935 the fertilizer calculations all came from the EC750 and the crop removal numbers came from the quantities of plant nutrients contained in crops EX8009, all SDSU publications. So with that, Mark, um, should we open the spreadsheet? Maybe I'll have you give a, give a introduction to the layout of the spreadsheet and the, kind of some housekeeping uh, documents. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Before we open it, I thought I'd just cover... A couple of points um, let you know that the spreadsheet it was designed specifically for the purpose of collecting and storing this information from the producer or consultant by the zone the grid uh, or the grid for up to 15 fields in an operation the information that we're collecting includes the producer's name the field number grid number zone number soil tests crops grown yield goals fertilizer product supplied and the amount supplied. The spreadsheet can calculate also a recommendation of N, P205 and K20 based on land grant university recommendations, specifically the South Dakota State University method, like Eric said earlier, using the EC750. Uh, the limit, the spreadsheet has limits and the limits are up to 15 fields will fit in the spreadsheet and we can go up to 17 zones or grids and that uh, typically will be plenty of, of zones grids we're going to run out of space but uh, we're going to have you fill in the first uh, 17 and and uh, we'll be able to evaluate uh, what was applied from there the spreadsheet has a couple tools built in the user can build custom blends as part of the application uh, documentation. So if we don't have a particular blend in the list, then you can build your own, um, let you build a couple of them. The spreadsheet can also be used as a planning tool to, to look at what would be recommended by the EC750 for the particular crop, yield goal, and so on. Uh, so that's a pretty handy feature, I think. Uh, it also checks the data as you enter your information, if there's additional data that it needs, it will ask you for that. If you use a two-year calculation, for example, the spreadsheet automatically sends you to the second year uh, page and has you enter the crop and yield goals. So I think with that, we can, I'll send it back to Eric here and we can uh, take a look at that spreadsheet and get into the details of it. Yeah, great. Thank you. So we'll have Mark open up a spreadsheet. Um, there's basically two ways this can be done. Uh, we can use it as a documentation tool. And so Mark's going to open up a spreadsheet that we're going to say was emailed back to the NRCS office. So so him or I as an NRCS employee are going to be able to take a look and see what crop was grown yield goal was placed, what fertilizer was applied. See if we are following the rules or the guidelines that were explained in that in that specification guide. So we can do that. We're going to first agree to the disclaimer. Uh, we're going to read through that carefully. We're going to agree to it. Click to continue. So this would be how we could 
see this form being completed by a producer or agronomist. At the top, they got the name, the field ID, the crop year that it was grown, the crop that was planted. Um, that's all from a drop-down list. Um, if it was a no-till field or not, that would be indicated by yes or no. If it's left blank, we're considering it no. Same thing with the two-year calculation, um, if it was a two-year or spread or not. Um, so as I'm going through that, that heading part, maybe now would be a good time to explain. There's On the left-hand side, there's a lot of buttons, I guess, over there. And they're pretty helpful, pretty handy. So this print button, I'd encourage you to get in the habit of using that for, uh, for a couple different reasons. That's only going to print the fields that have data in them. And like Mark said, this spreadsheet has 15 fields as you scroll to the right. Um, so all these blank pages won't print if you just go... For the oh yeah, only with the fields, field ID is filled out. That's where we'll get data to print. If you just go up to file and print, you're going to get all 15 pages. So if you only want the pages with data, just use that print button. Um, the video that's being recorded today will be stored in this video link uh, tab at the bottom and it'll be broke down into uh, different segments so you don't don't have to watch the whole video to see the, the, the part that you're interested in. So that'll be on there. Um, this check crop names, we're going to demonstrate how that works but basically what that's doing is if you copy and paste your soil test information here from a soil testing lab, it's going to make sure that the previous crop name is named that the program or the spreadsheet can understand it and give the appropriate legume credits. So it's important to make sure that we check those crop names if we're copying and pasting um, fields in here, soil test values in here. So we'll do that. If you scroll down just a little bit, Mark, there's a add custom blends button in blue there. That's going to be really handy when we come to, uh, to showing the applied fertilizer. Um, and that, it, okay, there's this other button down here, the show recommendations. We're going to show how that button operates too here in a little bit. So those are our buttons and kind of the layout of the spreadsheet. Uh, like Mark said, there's 17 zone or grid points as you scroll down there, and there's 15 fields as you scroll across. So that's the limits of the spreadsheet is, is that. So typically, we, you know, if you're doing a field composite or a flat rate, you obviously just have one line to fill out on your field. And if you're doing zones, you'll complete however many zones are in that field. I've seen anywhere from three to maybe seven, nine zones, depending on the variability of the field and, and the people doing the work. For grids, it's commonly done on two and a half acres uh, per grid, but we're only going to take the top 17. Just start at grid point number one and, and complete 17 in a row. That's all the data we're going to ask for. I would encourage you, if you are doing grids, to have this spreadsheet uh opened up at the time that the grids are developed and the prescriptions are wrote and all this data that it's asking for here in the applied section will be right on your screen and you can copy and paste it right in here. If you come back say today and look at some grids that were developed last fall it's going to be a lot more challenging to get that data uh, on nutrients applied per grid point. So with that, we're going to show you what this agronomist um, or producer provided to us as documentation for 590 standard. So they had uh, four zones in there, previous crop was soybeans, date that soil samples were taken, number of acres per zone, soil tests for 0 to 6 and 6 to 24. Um, since our crop that is being grown is corn, we need a, a 6 to 24 inch for a nitrogen requiring crop. Our soil test Phosphorus levels were both in the Olson and the Bray scale, so those are in the appropriate columns, and the potassium is over there on the right-hand side. So that's our soil test. As we scroll down just a little bit, you'll see the yield goals. It's very important to have that put in there. Um, and then the products that were applied and the dates that those applications were made. So this producer used uh, urea as a nitrogen source pre-plant along with some potassium and some um, kind of a homemade uh, MES product. Uh, with some nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and zinc. We did not keep track of the sulfur and zinc where the spreadsheet's only going to track the three major nutrients, N, P, and K. So that's all you guys need to keep track of is N, P, and K. So they did they did those three applications early before uh, the corn is planted. They did 28%, they did 1034-0 with the planter, five gallons of 1034-0, and then they came back and applied 10 gallons of 28% with the pre-emerge herbicide. 
So those were the nutrient applications that were made. Now, if we want to see how close those balance with the SDSC EC750, there's a tab at the bottom. You just click, simply click that button or that tab down there, and it's laid out with nitrogen first. It's got your, your zones, your yield goals, uh, previous crops, gives you the appropriate credits, your soil test credits. If there was no till, it add 30 pounds to the, the nitrogen recommendation. It gives you then the recommendation, what was actually applied to this field, and then are you plus or minus um, that recommendation. So we came out perfectly in balance on our nitrogen. Phosphorus and potassium are the next two right below that. Same thing, we have our soil test, we have our recommendation, and then we have our nut nutrients applied, our, our phosphorus applied. And you notice there that zones one and three, the first two rows on there, are 20 pounds higher than what was recommended. And basically, because our soil test values that 30 and 22 on the Olson scale came up to a zero recommendation, but we still put on five gallons of 10340. So we applied 20 pounds of phosphorus. And that's the reason, if you remember when I said there was a 30 pound tolerance when we were talking about the specification guide, so that 20 pounds of starter fits well within our 30 pound tolerance. So that works pretty good. Um, the balance, if you, if you need to know more explanation about what that balance is, there's a little red triangle in the corner of that cell. Hover your mouse over it and that explanation will pop up and then you can read that. So anytime you see those red triangles throughout the spreadsheet, that's more information that you can read about. So same thing with potassium. Um, we had some different soil test values. Uh, a couple zones called for zero, a couple zones called for some nutrients. Uh, we put on exactly what was recommended, so we were perfectly in balance there. So there's one other thing I want to point out in this, this field before we do a second field example, and that would be on zone three, the second row of this spreadsheet. Uh, you notice there's a zero recommendation for P and K. And, and our soil test value for P is 22 Olson, and for K it's 192. And so those would still be below our um, kind of our cap for crop removal. So we could apply crop removal on that zone if we wanted to, um, or we could on the, the zones below that as well. And to get the crop removal numbers, there's a, there's a tab at the bottom simply called crop removal. If we click over there, They'll give us the P and K for crop removal. So you notice on that same um, spreadsheet line, now we're, instead of over applying 20 pounds like we did through our starter, now we're actually 45 pounds short if we're going crop removal rates. And same thing with potassium, we need another 53 pounds if we want to put on crop removal. And again, you can do that up to 25 uh, parts per million Bray, uh, no, 25 Olson, 35 Bray, or 200 on the potassium. That's when crop removal um, can't be used anymore once you reach those numbers. So hopefully that gives a little leeway to do what we need to do on a field-by-field -field basis. Anything else I forgot to mention there, Mark, before we skip to the next field? No, I think you did a really good job explaining that. Um, and the fact that these um, comment boxes are all over the spreadsheet. I would encourage people to take advantage of taking a look at some of the instructions, clarifications, lots of tips, so use that. All right, let's go to an example. Um, the next way this spreadsheet can be used, let's use it as a planning tool. So let's figure out how many pounds of nutrients we want to put on. Now we're going to show you how to import soil test values into the spreadsheet. So we're going to open the spreadsheet. Then we're going to open an Excel file with the soil test values and we're going to show you how to copy and paste those in there to save, save time from having to type all that information. So, so we'll Thank open you. that spreadsheet with our soil test values. And so we're going to copy and paste um, exactly the number of columns that we need. We're leaving off the field ID column because we don't need that in the spreadsheet. So he's going to copy and paste values. It's very important that we paste values in there. Um, we're going to enter the crop to be grown. It'll be corn. We're going to show you that it's our producer name. Uh, we're going to enter a field ID. And then we're going to enter the, oops, 
Then we're going to enter the year that this crop will be grown. And we're going to say we're going to grow this in 2019. And uh, if you want no-till or not, that just adds 30 pounds to the nitrogen credit. But we're going to show you a two-year spread, so we're going to click yes there. If you leave it blank, it's considered no. So we can we can do it two ways. We can do it now or, or later, I guess. We didn't. We got to check our crop name, so our previous crop um, column there didn't match exactly. So the spreadsheet caught that, and it's going to ask us to correct that so we get the appropriate legume credits. First, it'll take us. First, it'll take us into the second year. Okay. Uh, where we need to enter in the yellow cells a yield goal for the zones for our second year crop, which we're going to grow soybeans. Correct. Uh, yield goals yield are, scores are 40, 50, and 60 in this example. And it's very important that we get a realistic yield goal for the field we're working on, obviously. But for our example, that's what we're using today. Click Done. The fact that it told us we got a problem with crop names, it hasn't fixed it yet. Okay. So, let's so I think our, we better just go fix it by clicking Crop check. Names. Soybean is the problem takes us to soybean here and we have to call it soybeans in this spreadsheet we'll say okay and that even though it doesn't change it here it's fixed to the point it can make the correct calculations so now we're getting the appropriate credits legume credits for our previous crop so we have our soil test values entered in there now let's um, figure out the nutrients we want to put on for our two-year spread so our our yield goal for our corn crop is going to be 150, 175, and 200. And the products, we're just going to pick three um, products. We're going to do uh, um, a phosphorus source like MAP or DAP, so like a, a 1050 or 1150. Yep, that'll be our phosphorus source. Then our, our potassium, 0060. And then we're going to show you how to do a custom blend for, uh, say, a urea AMS um, blend. So we can we can choose our custom blend, and it's going to be a dry blend. And we're going to use like a 75-25 ratio, so 0.397 will be the nitrogen. Um, we'll leave the, the phosphorus potassium blank. We don't have any of those nutrients in there. And the sulfur part, we don't need to be concerned with just the NPK. So we can click Done. For our custom blend and then we need to choose our custom blend option there so that's way at the bottom of the drop down list custom blend one and that shows us our percent nitrogen in that blend and then we're going to need to figure out how many pounds of each of these products to apply so we can simply scroll down show the recommendations button there on the left and we can start to complete that starting with our phosphorus source we'll choose p205 we can either type those in or copy and paste them up above and when we do copy, we obviously paste values to make sure we're doing that correctly. We can go down and get our potassium source, switch that to K2O, 0100. Uh, yes, this will be our, for our two-year spread. So it's, add, it's doing the math to calculate up what the soybeans need with those yield goals we entered, plus what the corn needs for, for this year. So... There's the nitrogen. And we can we can double check what we put on um, there under the SDSU EC750 tab. And that gives us our recommendations, our application rate, a producer applied, and then the balance to make sure that those balance perfectly. And down below on the P and K, that'll be the combination of the corn and the soybeans applied on there. So what we needed and what we applied, and they're both in balance. Crop removal tab, um, as long as we're below 25 parts per million Olson, 35 on the Bray scale, if we so desire, we could do crop removal or the C750 formula, whichever is greater. And so you'll see now that we there's additional nutrients needed if we wanted to do the full crop removal. And it shows us how many pounds of nutrients there for both P and K. We'd have to go ahead and do the math to figure out how many pounds of product we needed to put on and then go back to that field data tab and enter those uh, appropriate pounds of products in there. That'll do it. That concludes our copy and paste soil test data demonstration.